Hey guys, it's Lauren. Now I know I haven't done a proper tutorial in a while, which is crazy considering I started my channel basically with just tutorials. But recently I'm getting back into my active era, especially on my editing Instagram. And I just posted an edit that a lot of you guys seem to like. It was very different than a lot of the stuff I usually make because I actually used no plugins for this edit. That being said, the main question that you guys had regarding this edit is how I made it so smooth and flowy. So today I'm gonna teach you guys how to achieve that flowy effect and how to always keep your clips in motion so that there isn't even a nanosecond of choppiness in your edit. All right, enough said, let's get into it. So to begin with the very most important tip, you need to be able to overlap your keyframes from transition to transition, and you'll be able to do this just by using a ton of null object layers. So if you're unfamiliar with what a null object layer is, I'm gonna add one to my edit right now and show you what it can do. So go up to layer, new, and null object and it shows up right here as a red layer in your timeline. So for this example, I'm just using one big pre-composed clip of a film strip, and the effect I'm trying to achieve is having it start down here and pan upwards. So first, I'm just gonna connect my pre-composed clip to the null object layer. And if you have multiple clips rather than one big pre-composed one, just connect all of them to the null object layer. So we're gonna leave this null layer alone for a little bit while I work on the first part of the transition on the original pre-composition. So start Starting with my clip like this, I'm going to use position in transform to pan it up to the next photo. So I'm going to add a keyframe to start my position right here. And when adding my second keyframe, I'm going to be very generous with the amount of space that I leave between my two keyframes. What I mean by this is that I don't want this transition to be too fast. One thing that can really ruin an edit and make it super choppy is if the keyframes are way too close together. I think some editors might be hesitant when wanting to space out their keyframes because we've been conditioned to believe that your second keyframe needs to land right where the beat ends. But whenever I want to achieve that really smooth and clean effect, I place my second keyframe a few seconds after that transition or that beat in the audio actually ends. So for this clip specifically, I'm going to put it right here. Then I'm going to drag my clip up a little bit. And now we're entering another extremely important part in the process, which is making the graph. So first, I'm just going to easy ease my keyframes. Then I'm going to make sure that I'm on speed graph. So I've mentioned the concept of mid graphs a couple of times on my channel and my TikTok, but I'll just give you guys a quick refresher. So a mistake that a lot of editors make when doing null slides like this is that they'll use more traditional graph types rather than mid graphs. So in this scenario, let's say the beat in my audio is right here where my time indicator is. In that case, I'll go back to my keyframes and drag the first one right here. Now going back to my graph editor, I just push it all to the left. And this is what my transition looks like. The reason that it's so choppy is because it goes into that pan really abruptly and harshly. The purpose of a mid graph is to ease into the transition more delicately. So let's go back to the setup that I had before. And going back into the graph editor, let's say that the beat of the audio is still right here. And what I'm gonna do is make an in-style graph for this side and an out-style graph for this side. So to make an in-graph, of course, you just pull the knob a little bit to the right. And then to make your out-graph, you're gonna pull this knob to the left. And the key is to make sure that the peak of your graph is right on top of the time indicator where our beat hits. So you can adjust your graph accordingly so that it's right there. And this is what it looks like. The reason that it looks so smooth is because we've added this part to the graph right here. So we're not just easing out of the transition like in the first example I showed you, but we're also easing into it a little bit. As shown by the shape of the graph, we slowly start going into the pan, then it gets faster and faster until we reach the peak, and then it slows down again as we settle into the next picture. So now it's time to pan up into our next photo, and this is where the null object layer comes into play. So now let's say that the second beat in my audio is somewhere around here. But as you can see, my first transition still hasn't ended. And I'm not going to bring these keyframes any closer together or else it'll start looking choppy. So what I'm going to do is go into position on my null object layer so that I can start my second slide somewhere around here. So I'll add my first position keyframe. And based off of this, you can see that we're gonna start going into our second transition before the first one has fully finished. With this method, your clip is always going to be in motion and there's never gonna be an awkward second where the clip is just laying there still. So now let's drag my time indicator forward for the end of the transition and add my second keyframe. 
Just like before, I'm going to easy ease them. I'm going to drag my time indicator to where the beat is in the audio. So let's say it's right here. More often than not, the beat should hit at the midway point between your two keyframes. But this always depends on the audio and the overall pace of your edit. Now I'll go into my graph editor and create a mid graph where the peak is right here on my time indicator. And here's what it looks like. Now, another really cool thing about mid graphs is that you can change how fast or slow you want it to go. And to do this, you just have to make the peak of your graph sharper or flatter, depending on if you want it faster or slower. So for this transition, I want my mid graph to be a little bit faster. So I'm gonna drag my time indicator back on the peak so I remember where the beat is. And I'm just gonna bring my graph in a little bit. And I'm gonna make sure to even it out on the other side so that the peak of my graph still lands on the time indicator. And we can ensure that we're still hitting the beat even though we've changed up the graph a little bit. And here's what it looks like. So now what do we do when we pan up to this third photo? We obviously can't add more keyframes to the null object layer because we want the pan into the third photo to begin somewhere around here. And we already have keyframes here. So what you're gonna do is add another null object layer onto your timeline. And you can actually connect your first null object layer to your second one. And this is basically how I build all of my edits. You start with adding transitions to the original clip, but then you connect that clip to a null object layer. And then you connect that null object layer to another one, and then connect the second null object to a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, however many you need. So it's kind of just this big series of clips that are attached to null object layers and null object layers that are attached to more null object layers. If I say null object layer one more time, my mouth might fall off. So now I'm gonna repeat this whole process. I'm gonna have my third pan up start around here, then have the end of that transition be right around here. Let's say our imaginary beat drop is right here because obviously I'm not editing with an audio. The most satisfying thing ever, easy easing. Now to go to our graph editor and make yet another mid graph. So to put the concept of overlapping keyframes into perspective for you guys, I'm gonna show you all sets of my keyframes together. I like to describe this keyframe assortment as kind of like a staircase, where it kind of ascends upwards, but all of our keyframes are overlapped in some way. So for the next part of this tutorial, I'm actually gonna pop into the project file for my recent edit, so you guys can see exactly how I did the film strip portion of this. Disregard the fact that we have missing photos on this project file. But the part I want you guys to focus on is not the actual film strip coming out of the ticket booth, but the actual movement of the camera as it gets closer to the film strip. So I'm gonna tap into this pre-composition to show you guys a little bit more. And this null object layer right here is what controls the movement for that camera panning. Let's not distract you guys with all these other ugly keyframes. So I'm showing you guys these keyframes because I want you to see how quote unquote untraditional my graphs look for this transition. So I made these two position keyframes to have it zoom forward. I used the third position value. It's kind of similar to scale in the sense that it brings your clip forward, but it does it in this cool 3D way that gives layers and dimension to your edit. So now let's take a look at the graph behind these keyframes. Wait a minute, what graph? All I did was use Easy Ease for these keyframes. I did not manipulate the graph at all, I just left it as it was. Then the keyframes for the X and Z rotation was to give that cool like turny effect. As you can see at the beginning, it's a little bit counterclockwise and then it goes clockwise. So clicking into our X rotation keyframes, we can see that there is again no graph. And the same story for our Z rotation, no graph. The point I'm trying to make with this is that a lot of editors will be misguided by tutorials or other edits that they see and think that they always need to use a specific type of graph. Whether this be in graphs, out graphs, or mid graphs, editors might feel compelled to always use traditional graph types just because that's what they've always been told. And this might be going off on a little tangent, but it must be said, I think this is just a huge byproduct of the editing community being incredibly judgmental over other editors' graphs. There have been numerous occasions where I've went to TikTok and Instagram comment sections to see people just laughing or making fun of someone else's graphs. 
And so because of that, of course, editors are going to feel pressured into only using certain types of graphs and sticking to this template mold of what a good graph or a good edit looks like. But you know why I ended up using these graphs and realized that they looked the best? Because I was willing to tweak with my edit and do something different that I usually don't do. When I was first making this transition, I actually used a mid graph for all of these but it just seemed too slow and kind of weird to me. I didn't freak out just because my mid graph didn't look good on this one transition, even though it usually does, because different graphs work for different clips and transitions. The worst thing you can do as an editor is stick to one style of graph because it's not going to work for every single clip. You have to really step back, evaluate your clip, your transition, what you want to do with it, and determine what pattern of movement works best for that specifically. A lot of you guys always ask me how I improve as an editor and how I just, this sounds conceited, but like get better every time. Those were your words, not mine. And my main thing is understanding that even if something looks good and even if I'm used to one style of editing, I can always try something new and I might even end up liking it better than what I was doing before. Another thing that's important to note about these keyframes is again the spacing between them. My clip starts and ends right here, but my transitions go past the beginning of the clip and past the end. And I use that technique to ensure that my clip is always in motion. If I started my keyframes right here or ended them right here, there would just be a really awkward pause before the clip actually starts moving and then another awkward pause at the end where it's kind of just still. So now that I've got my main points across, to end this video off, I'm gonna give you two other methods just to make your edits a little bit smoother. The first one is to add tiny rotations to your transitions. So for this example, I'm gonna have this clip zoom in, then zoom right back out. I added a fade in and fade out so it doesn't look horrible, but we can definitely make this smoother. So I'm gonna go to rotation and at the beginning, I'm gonna have it start out at around negative three. Then I'm gonna drag my time indicator past the actual end of the clip so that there isn't any awkward stillness at the end like I talked about. And then I'm gonna add another one and put that at positive two. And you can adjust these values yourself depending on how intense you want the rotation to be. Now I'm gonna easy ease my keyframes and this is what it looks like now. The difference isn't huge, but it just adds a little bit more motion and makes it look more flowy. And my last piece of advice, which is specifically for edits with masks, is to take advantage of the puppet pin tool. So I'm just gonna create a quick mask. It's going to be bad. I don't wanna hear anything. I haven't edited in so long that I forgot that Roto Brush existed for a minute, but by that time I was already almost done masking this, so don't clown me in the comments, I'm sensitive. So now we go up to our puppet pin tool, which is this one right here. And what you're gonna do is add pins on all parts of the picture where you don't want anything to move. So I'm just gonna scatter them all down here. And then I'm gonna add a pin at the focal point of where I want the movement to be. I added mine right here in the middle of her face. Now we're gonna go down to the puppet tool, carry it down on mesh one. And as you can see, it's already added keyframes for all of the pins. But the only one we're interested in is this one right here, which is the last one I added. So it shows up as puppet pin 14. It's so kindly already added the first keyframe for me. So I'm gonna drag my time indicator forward a little bit, add another keyframe. And by using this first position value, I'm gonna move her head a little bit to the left. So I like to do it very subtly because if you do it too intensely, she'll look like this, which we definitely don't want. Then I just ease the keyframes. And as you can see, it gives a really cool animated look to my photo. All right, guys, that's all for today's video. Thank you so, so much for watching and supporting even through a hiatus. Nothing fills me with more fulfillment than being able to help you guys or being the one that inspires you to open your laptop or phone and edit. So if you're watching this tutorial right now, you better use it. Go take these skills and make an incredible edit. And I just love you guys so much. Remember that. All right, have a great day or night wherever you are and bye.